What does a Grace Wind tale of the lead's murder hide from the player off camera? Now, I know when we covered Do You Copy, I said that being a park ranger in Gracewind Park was one of the scariest jobs a horror game protagonist could have. But it turns out that being a detective may be even worse, especially if your work brings you to a haunted cabin in that very same forest. Today, we're going to be looking behind the scenes and breaking the lead's murder in as many ways as possible. From accessing a hidden map, to showing off some bizarre things out of bounds, to messing with the goat man. As always, I hope you enjoy. Now as per usual, I'd like to give a quick summary of what we'll be covering so we're all on the same page. The Leeds murder starts us off in a small office building where we're met with a phone call. And during this brief call, a frantic mother asks us to find her son Michael, who she believes went to Gracewind Park. Shortly after leaving, we find ourselves in the forest, where we're met with a peculiar wooden door. This door acts like a portal, and even if we go back through it, we will always come out facing this pathway leading deeper to the forest. Following this path, we eventually find ourselves at a large cabin, where once inside, we can hear a knocking sound coming from the bedroom. And upon moving the bed to the side, we find a trap door that is locked with five iron shackles. A disembodied voice talks to the player from underneath this door. And from here, we're meant to complete a ritual by putting various items into said shackles. In the true ending, the player is able to leave as the portal home is no longer preventing us from leaving, and the game comes to a close. Now I'll be summarizing each of the endings as we go, because there's just too much to this game for me to break it down all at once. But without further ado, let's brighten things up a bit and take a look at the title screen. So the title screen is essentially the same map that we spend majority of our time on. And similar to the first game, there are mountains and trees surrounding the player to obscure their view of these outside areas. It's obviously not as big as the original game's map, which we'll be comparing it to later, but here's a view of the whole map from above. Inside the cabin though, there are some pretty interesting things to check out. For starters, since this is only the title screen, none of the objects that the player can interact with are currently loaded in, which results in books and candles floating in midair. These interactable objects are actually stored in a different UMAP file in Unreal Engine, and they aren't utilized on the title screen. This also means that the trapdoor and bed are missing in the bedroom, leaving an empty hole that leads under the house. However, one of the coolest things I found in the cabin was actually hidden away in the living room. In the attic, normally out of view from the player, are three ripped up teddy bears sitting in a cage. One is missing its mouth, one is missing its ears, and the last is missing its eyes. This is most likely a reference to the phrase, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. The player can't jump or climb on top of objects in the cabin, so they normally never see this. And while I'm not exactly sure why these guys are here, it's super cool seeing them just sitting up here. But that's it for the title screen, so let's move on to the office where the game starts off. Now this portion of the game is actually pretty short and doesn't have a lot to show, but there are a couple of interesting things for us to look at. For starters, although you can see a blue sky and clouds outside, if we fly through the walls, we can see that there is no ground outside of this room. This office building is just kind of floating in the void all alone. However, I was curious what was beyond that door in our office. And upon moving the player into the hallway, you'll see that it's just an empty space with textured walls and floors. You can walk around freely back here though, which is pretty cool. I also found what looks like a window hidden in a spot you normally cannot access, as well as a second enclosed hallway that's just beyond the wall we can see from our office. For those of you who are curious, by the way, you can walk in the roof of this building too. It's just some simple geometry up here though, and falling off this roof does not have a trigger that causes the player to die. Meaning, if you fall off, you'll fall infinitely into the void. Now before moving on to the next map, I want to explore something else that I found that was hidden in the game files. This map is called Lake Scene, and it appears to be an early beta version of the office building's exterior. There are multiple objects here that are covered by this flat gray texture as well. There's a car, multiple street signs, and what looks like a small building, among other things. It's hard to say exactly what this map was meant to be, but what I find most interesting are these large rectangles that are just sort of floating in the back. They're just massive objects with what looks like a lake scene textured onto them, which makes sense given the map name. I'm not sure exactly why these are here, but they're definitely a cool find. This could be a prepackaged demo area, or perhaps at one point it did play a role in the plot. After all, there is a big lake in Gracewind Park. And speaking of Gracewind Park, so upon arriving at the park, the first thing I wanted to do was check out that strange door that's in the middle of the path leading through the forest. So this door is interesting because it always put you back on the path facing the cabin. And looking at this from a different perspective is pretty strange. The way this works is the portal's appearance is directly tethered to the player's camera. And by doing so, it can trick the player into believing they're walking back to where they started. 
In reality, you're just simply getting turned around the moment you touch it. Skipping ahead to the cabin itself, there are a bunch of interesting occurrences that are triggered by the player's progress in the game. For instance, after collecting the UV light in the kitchen, a ghost will appear in the hallway, heading towards the living room. It is hard to get a good look at it because of how quickly it moves. However, up close this ghost is actually pretty creepy. It's a mostly transparent green figure with a scary face, and they're shrouded in a green mist. They simply flood down the hallway and unload once they reach the living room. Something else I noticed is that at the bottom of the basin in the kitchen, after we dissolve the crow, we could find that there is what looks like a silver ring just sitting in the center. Moving the camera up close, we can see that it's not the same ring we acquire later by melting the wax doll, so I'm not entirely sure what this is. Now flying around this map, we'll not only see those same teddy bears I mentioned before, but there are also a couple of things hidden out of bounds that we normally never see. For starters, under the ground just outside the house, we can find a lit candle just floating in the void. It's fully animated, and I'm not entirely sure why it would be out here, but here it is. Also, way beyond the borders of the map, directly behind the cabin, we can find one of the notes normally found in the game just floating out here. So depending on which items are used for the ritual, there are a few different endings that the player can get. In this case, I used the music box, glass eye, goat horn, and wax stall. Sacrificing this set of items results in the goat man appearing at the front of the cabin, where he opens the door, enters the house, and takes us out with a single swipe of his claws. If we move the camera outside, we can see that the goat man actually just appears out of nowhere. He then slowly walks forward, rotates to face the door, and then ducks through the doorway. From here, we can look at him up close, and one of the first things you'll notice is he has what looks like a gem embedded into his forehead, and his mouth is all torn up, with his tongue hanging out. Similar to the first game, he has a long set of goat horns, one of which being broken near the end. He also has sharp claws on each of his hands. Comparing the Goat Man models from both games also shows just how creepy this game's version is. Unlike the first game, he is a fully textured monstrosity, and watching his animation play out in slow motion is also quite unsettling. Well, that is until he starts A-posing to assert dominance. As funny as this is, he's still pretty menacing to look at. After this, we respawn, and we can start our second playthrough. Now these playthroughs are mostly the same except for a couple of small variations, including this ghost who puts a lighter on the shelf in the hallway. Once again we can view this from a different angle, and we can see it's the same ghost as before, except this time it's moving in the opposite direction and unloads once it reaches that shelf. Now the second playthrough actually allows us to access the true ending, in which a portal is formed at the back door. A door that is normally locked and completely inaccessible. This portal teleports you to a path in Gracewind Park that leads you to the original watchtower from Do You Copy. Inside this tower is a lockbox containing a sigil they will be used for the ritual back at the cabin. However, at this point, the Goat Man is also roaming freely on this map, and will pursue the player if spotted. I discovered that if you go back through the portal leading into the cabin, and then step right back out, the Goat Man's AI will mess up a bit and he will struggle to attack you. He tries swinging his claws at you, but does no damage when he hits you. However, after a bit he figures out what he's doing wrong, and I unfortunately die. But it was at this point that I made another discovery. If you save and quit during this portion of the game, and then load back in, the portal in that door will be gone, and the door will be wide open. This means you can walk through that door and into the forest. Now there is an invisible barrier that prevents the player from progressing out here, and unfortunately that's not the only thing stopping us from moving forward either. When we reloaded the game earlier, we somehow broke the game's normal sequence of events. This means if we try to sacrifice items for the ritual, the game will infinitely hang up, and we can't progress. So sadly that means you have to start from the very beginning. Now going back to the Watchtower map, we will find that it is in fact the same exact map as the first game, including the lake in the center of the map and the other Watchtower. There are a few differences though, like these flooding trees over by the second Watchtower. There's a large portion of the forest just hovering several feet off the ground, but it's way out of the view of the player so you never see it normally. And speaking of floating objects, directly above the lake we can find the lid to the lockbox just hovering here. I'm not sure why it's stored over here, but it's far enough away that the player would never see it under normal circumstances. We can also walk around this map, as all of this is indeed solid ground. Also, something else that's changed in this map is that second watchtower. It doesn't have that giant yellow light in it anymore, which means if we teleport the player inside, we can walk inside the interior unobstructed. What's most interesting about this map though, is that we technically never left the map we started on. When we went through that portal in the cabin, this other section of Gracewind Park loaded in on top of the existing map. 
So if we fly over here, we can see that the cabin is still loaded in, and comparing the sizes of these maps is insane. Graceswim Park is a lot bigger than it seems at first glance, especially when you have the cabin for scale. Now, if we move the player over here, we can actually walk around and interact with all the objects inside completely unhindered. It's a bit interesting seeing these maps loaded in at the same time though, and how they repurposed the original map to coincide with a new one. Now, if we fly over to the portal, we can see the goat man is loaded in and wandering through the trees waiting to come in contact with a player. And at this point, I wanted to see if we could mess with him. So by going in and out of the portal enough times, I found out you can break the goat man in more ways than one. And as you can see at this point, the goat man can't damage us. And if we go through the portal once more, his animation breaks and he's stuck in a single frame of his animation. He just kind of slides through the forest and even when he's screeching and attacking, he will remain in this frozen state. Now I have one last thing to show you and that's the ending where the player has their body stolen by the disembodied voice in the bedroom. In this ending, the voice coming from behind the cellar door announces that she'll be leaving the house in your body. The ground beneath the cabin starts to glow purple, and sweat runs down the screen as the camera distorts and fades to black. So, if we go under the house during all of this, we will find nothing. There's simply a light being emitted from underneath the wood floors that makes it seem as though something is beneath there creating it, but it is in fact still empty. But with that, that is everything I was able to find hidden out of bounds in the Leeds murder. I hope you all enjoyed this video, subscribe if you did, and I'll see you all soon in the next one. Cheers!